Thank you very much, uh, Director Mark, for an excellent introduction to Her Excellency, and I'm humbled by your very kind words as well. So we have a very important uh, event today, which is uh, uh, proudly supported by UNESCO and DEPED. We are working together, and certainly Her Excellency has been a source of inspiration for my office in Jakarta and also to, uh, I would say, billions of people around the world. So we will be learning some very important aspects of uh, how the education can be inclusive and uh, the different aspects right up to uh, the multi-stakeholder engagement and also the funding aspects. And no other than Her Excellency's experience in leading Philippines to become a very strong learning nation uh, is the right uh, kind of emphasis from Her Excellency. So, uh, dear uh, uh, Her Excellency, let me begin, first of all, the first area, inclusion and uh, education in the context of Philippines. Can you please give us uh, uh, the Philippines' uh, own aspects related to vulnerable groups, including persons with disabilities, and education as a right, how uh, DAPAD is promoting under your leadership. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's good to see you again, if only virtually, and carry on our conversation, which we also had uh, last year. And it's a pleasure to be with all of the advocates of education, not only in the Philippines, but also in Asia and the rest of the world. And uh, as all of us know, our battle cry is one, no one should be left behind. And that includes people with disabilities and special requirements. And that the other battle cry, uh, which is a topic of vigorous conversation uh, in Philippines, of course, is education must uh, continue. So how are we uh, implementing? First of all, this is uh, provided for in the Constitution. Constitution does not make any distinction between and among peoples from different groups or with different needs. It just says that it should be available to all Filipino children, to all Filipino learners. And this is why when we had our usual crisis, annual crisis, whether natural disasters and natural uh, events as well, and uh, political, uh, political uh, interventions, etc., etc. We always made sure that education will continue and that no one will be left behind. So, uh, for example, uh, in this uh, pandemic, uh, Dr. Khan and uh, <clears throat> Our decision was immediate decision when uh, our government uh, decided to lock down uh, the, the country at that time last March was that we should continue uh, our preparations for education. We should make adjustments. So what we did was to work on the curriculum uh, immediately. We made decisions and proposals to the president on when schools uh, should open, but the focus was on curriculum and the need for uh, appropriate uh, learning uh, spaces. And um, we spent uh, several months uh, preparing our teachers for the shift to uh, a different learning modality. Uh, earlier, we were very dependent on face-to-face uh, -face, uh, blended learning. And now, because of the uh, concern of the president for the health of our learners, for their safety, um, we are uh, having a, a combination of blended learning as well as other modalities. And so we shifted to different uh, modes of teaching. Uh, we have a platform. Uh, we also uh, are developing, we have developed more than 200 television uh, programs, uh, radio programs, as well as the uh, preferred uh, modality of our teachers and our learners right now, which is for printed material. However, we are aware of the consequences of uh, excessive use of printed materials on our environment, 
uh, right now we are paying for uh, what we did uh, decades ago to our forests and um, our natural resources and we are now uh, suffering from, from floods uh, and our school system is also um, affected. So uh, we are uh, endeavoring to modify our approach to blended uh, learning to include other learning platforms like television and radio in addition to the printed material. So that's, that's in the curriculum aspect. As for the inclusion aspect, um, Dr. Khan, uh, this remains and continues to be a challenge and we look forward to the passage of the bill, which we completely agree with, uh, proposed by Senator uh, Gatsalian to strengthen our, our programs and funding for learners who have uh, special and, and different needs. And this would include uh, alternative learning uh, systems. We are all aware that education is not only part of the social development sector, it is uh, in a sense very heavily affected by what is happening in the economy. Uh, our enrollment from um, private sector uh, educational system has, has dropped by more than uh, by 50% because people are out of jobs and they cannot send their children to private schools. And there is also an excess of children uh, enrolled in our public schools. And we want to maintain this balance between public and private education. So this is as far as curriculum, this is as far as um, uh, gadgets and the learning environment uh, is concerned. Uh, we are also adjusting our schedules uh, for uh, opening as well as closing of classes because a law was passed uh, this year by our uh, House of Congress and the Senate, wherein it is the president who decides when schools should be opened. And what we do is give him the choices and the uh, possible uh, advantages or disadvantages of particular choices for the opening of school. And we did open our schools last October uh, this year uh, in basic education. So these sure. are just a few of the adjustments and responses that we initiated. Uh, I am really very uh, heartened to know all about uh, all these excellent uh, adjustments and very timely adjustments. And this is not only for the Philippines. There are 1.5 billion children and uh, youth in 140 countries, uh, 140 UNESCO member states who have been affected. And certainly Philippines sets a very high example. Your Excellency, if I can explore a little bit further on the measures uh, during COVID-19, you have certainly given excellent examples. How about the uh, student graduation exams? How have you dealt with the, that from the point of view of safety and security after the blended learning is going very successfully? Yes, uh, the lockdown of, of the country last March uh, was announced last March, by, last March by the president. And it coincided with the uh, uh, closure of the academic school year. And so we had to uh, work out immediately how our, our teachers our, our, and our learners would adjust to schedules of examinations, grading systems, and so on. And we did make corresponding adjustments, uh, depending uh, on the places, because we have also, uh, Dr. Khan, uh, an interagency committee, which includes the Department of Education, uh, which assesses the, the state of uh, the extent of the, of the prevalence of COVID-19. So we, we adjust and we listen to the advice also of the Department of Health and what we describe now as the IATF or in Interagency Task Force on COVID-19. And, and, and these were very, very strict and uh, particular so that uh, the safety of our learners and our teachers will be assured. So this is really very good that it's a comprehensive program uh, right from understanding the curricula, yes. understanding yes. the needs of examination. But also, I really like this uh, response from the Philippines where you have actively coordinated 
among all the different departments yes. in terms of the total response. If we can go one step further, Your Excellency, and I'm always impressed with your uh, take and your understanding as well as your strong drive towards bringing NGOs, uh, the multi-stakeholder approach. So can you please give us an idea of uh, education as a basic human right, SDG number four, mm -hmm. is very important for the Philippines, for the future of the Philippines. Yes, yes. How you have uh, brought the NGO uh, working together? And many times the NGO may have some conflict as well uh, with the uh, bigger aims and objectives. How do we harmonize their interests with the interests uh, of uh, the public? And uh, how NGOs uh, have been playing their role uh, during this difficult uh, COVID-19 uh, time with the Department of Education? Uh, yes, excellent question, uh, Dr. Khan. Uh, even before the pandemic, we have reached out to the NGO sector as well as to business. And uh, we have uh, organized uh, what we call the Education Forum. And we have regular meetings with them. And uh, oftentimes, we don't even have to wait uh, to, to, uh, for ourselves to, to call them or to consult with them because they also get in touch with us. So whoever has an issue would, would call for a consultation. And we are doing this on a regular basis. And uh, the Philippine government recognizes this at the level of the cabinet secretary. Uh, he convenes on a regular basis conversations, exchanges of views and advice between and among uh, NGOs, the business sector, uh, owners of, for example, private schools who are really uh, badly affected uh, by, by the pandemic. And uh, we exchange views, they give advice, and, and we tell them also the response of the president to, to their proposal. So it's a very uh, healthy uh, and positive uh, relationship. Yes. So this is really wonderful. And this model of public-private partnership to deliver SDGs, SDG number four, as a basic human right yes. is really critical. Businesses also at large need to take ownership of the areas where they work. And through better co cooperation with the government, there can be uh, more synergies. Uh, and I'm really very impressed yes. with uh, all the programs. Yes. If we can go one step further on this, uh, all governments in the world have been affected with their budgets and with their spending. And uh, during this time when the COVID uh, has affected all of our budgets, um, how uh, the government of Philippines uh, and uh, under your le leadership, the DEPED, has been uh, working on uh, uh, the mechanisms for the regulation of uh, education spending. This would be very important for other countries to learn from you also, Your Excellency. Uh, well, uh, what happened is um, the government put up what we describe, what is described as the Bayanihan Fund, and it is funded by contributions from different uh, government uh, agencies, depending on the, the capacity to contribute or depending on the status of their programs, if this can be postponed. And we also um, uh, had uh, very long conversations with the Department of the Budget. So what we did was we, for the first uh, round of assistance, because government committed to assist everyone who is affected by, by the pandemic, uh, we contributed, uh, um, I, I believe, eight billion from our budgets to the fund, which is for everybody. But at the same time, Dr. Khan, we submitted a request for assistance from the government for the specific needs of education. And uh, this is where uh, we had a very intense and cordial meetings with our, uh, our finance committee, our department of the budget. And uh, I personally uh, dealt with my uh, colleagues uh, in, in, in the cabinet. And uh, so uh, they were, uh, they continued to support us because what happened is, okay, we contributed to the big fund, but at the same time, we sought assess assistance from this very same big fund for the needs of education, which were uh, recognized by 
the Department of Finance and the Department of Budget and Management, but it had to be undertaken at the level of the leadership of the department itself. No less uh, than the secretary uh, had to talk with uh, the two other secretaries and uh, make presentations, and eventually the president. And uh, the, the president made a statement which uh, became uh, viral after I made a presentation on our needs. And he said, I'm willing to scrape the bottom of the barrel to continue education. And that uh, was a very uh, uh, reassuring statement. So whenever we ask for something and we have to defend it, of course, uh, justify our expenditures, but always at the back of the mind of our finance team is that the president said, even if we scrape the bottom of the barrel, education will always be supported. Yes. So this is a really excellent example. First of all, everyone has to contribute to solve the bigger national yes. problem. So the Japan has contributed and contributed very significant amount, 8 billion peso must be a very big part of the budget, but then making the right kind of uh, uh, plea and uh, you as a champion of education as a basic human right, I'm very happy to know that also uh, His Excellency President uh, uh, doing the straightening of the barrel to make sure education must continue. That's very important. A related question, uh, Your Excellency, is uh, um, in every country we have very poor people, people who have been left behind for too long. And many times uh, those families um, have difficult situation even to send their children to school uh, and to fund their basic needs. And uh, that's where many uh, drop out out of uh, uh, this uh, uh, education system. Are there any special policies for funding, uh, funding assistance for poor students and uh, how uh, successful they have been to bringing those people who have been left behind for too long? Uh, we already have an existing program, even before I became Minister of, of Education, wherein um, government, for example, uh, um, gives assistance to private schools who, uh, who admit uh, children from various, uh, economic, uh, various economic sectors. And uh, we do this both for senior high school and for junior high school, because the Constitution is, is very clear. And also uh, this time when uh, teachers uh, from private schools uh, were deprived of, of their uh, income because uh, schools were closed uh, initially uh, in, in particular places, uh, we have campaigned and now uh, uh, the second round of, of Bayanihan uh, includes uh, uh, compensation and assistance for teachers who by circumstances could not teach because uh, private schools are uh, closed. And now also for the poor children, we have the alternative learning uh, systems, which uh, where we program uh, school days on school hours at um, times which are not necessarily uh, uh, harmonious with the regular class sessions, which uh, uh, are children the rest of our children uh, um, undergo. So we have the alternative learning systems for those who work. And Dr. Khan, this also accounts for the drop in enrollment since there was massive unemployment and uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, um, overseas workers came back to the Philippines, returned to the Philippines and they didn't have jobs immediately. So they could not join our alternative learning systems. Uh, I'm very proud of the Alternative Learning Systems Program uh, because um, at the beginning of his term, the president himself uh, also uh, supported the ALS uh, program, which we are continuing. And it has even become more urgent at this time because of the loss of jobs and the downturn in the economy. So thank you very much. That's really very important. And I'm so uh, pleased to also learn, and this should be an example, that while DEPED is uh, responsible, of course, first of all, for all schools funded by the government, but also helping teachers who are in difficulty from the private schools as well. So yes. it's, basically, it's a national service education as a basic human right and bringing all of that together. So that's really a wonderful example coming from the Philippines and how do we continue our efforts together on all areas of inclusive education 
and for those families and overseas uh, Filipino who are coming back because there are no more jobs in those countries. So that's really very important as part of being inclusive, considering all of that. If we can continue on the same um, about the social programs. So you have already started mentioning, uh, Your Excellency, that inclusive education, of course, education is a very comprehensive field which brings all different aspects of our life and our culture, our values, uh, and our future. And that's where the social programs uh, are inseparable from uh, what education um, uh, must be doing. So how does uh, those programs play a major role in education in, uh, in the Philippines? Remember last year, Dr. Khan, you gave me this book by Harari. Uh, yes, yes, yes uh, on, on, on Homo Deus. And I read it very carefully as I have read his other works as well. And so uh, I had discussions with uh, my uh, under secretaries, assistant secretaries, and many groups of people. And we proposed to the Senate for our budget for the creation of a futures unit in the uh, department, not just uh, planning for the end of our term or planning for the electoral uh, exercises which take place every uh, six years, but what education will be like or what society will be like. So, and the Senate has been very supportive, especially uh, Senator uh, Pia Cayetano, as well as the former speaker, and now the present speaker. And so uh, they have supported the creation of an education futures. So what we try to do is to not so much as uh, inundating or drowning our children in data and facts, which they can get uh, from other sources, but to deal with change, to know that there is change, that when they go out into the world, the world will have changed uh, by then. And so we have this futures uh, uh, unit, which is supported by the legislature, funded by the legislature, wherein we will adjust, we will, uh, our, our curriculum especially, and even the matter, uh, Dr. Khan, of um, uh, design of our school buildings. Every year we spend billions and billions in destroyed school buildings. So we have to look at how we design them, where we locate our, our, our infrastructure. How do we store our, our materials, our gadgets, especially since we are uh, depending more and more on, on, on gadgets, radios, television programs, and so on. What do we do when it is signal number one? Uh, should our laboratories be in the first floor of our school buildings? And we say, it's not practical if your school is located beside the river. I have visited Dr. Khan at schools all over the country, which are located beside rivers and beside the sea. And therefore, the risk is uh, quite obvious. So th this uh, seemingly unimportant matters have to be taken seriously. But the future of education, what it will be, what society will be like. And, and we have always emphasized uh, that while technology is very important, we will be relying more on technology. We should never forget that we are humans that we are not robots. And, no. Uh, no, we, we, we cannot be, <laughs> we cannot be <laughs> robots. So th these things we have to teach our children now so that they will have to, they will have the capacity to analyze and to deal, as I said, with change because definitely change is here, change is coming and change will be the mode of the future of our children. So certainly. That's what I would like to share with you, Your Excellency. A recent OECD report uh, has projected that 3% of lower individual income in the future can be affected, and 5% of the loss of the country GDP because of the slowing down of the learning systems and because of the closure of schools and because of all the difficulties around the world. So maybe your final take on um, as you are leading whole Philippines and very proudly 
for us as well as for all Filipinos. Uh, you are taking us into future where there is a bright future, better economy, better society, and certainly also you take care of the environment even during these COVID times. Uh, how we are preparing in your view uh, in Philippines and globally that we do not uh, suffer such losses for the low income people into future because of learning difficulties and for the economies because unless we spend more on education and learning uh, the path to recovery is not going to be easy. Just a very brief uh, uh, take from your excellency. Well, uh, we are always classified, uh, Dr. Khan, as a social development institution. Uh, in our government system, we are part of the social development uh, uh, cluster. But uh, I have been visiting the economic development uh, cluster because very clearly uh, what happens in education will also be shaped by what happens in the economy and vice versa. Uh, in the future, we'll be needing uh, very specific kinds of you know, skills, competitive skills, and even the idea of stopping or freezing the education process will uh, re result in um, very dangerous losses of competition and preparedness of our, of our learners and in the matter also of finding jobs, etc. And we have to prepare them that there is change, there will be change, and they have to accept it, even as it's not, it, it challenges us. We have to teach differently, and the children will have to study differently. The parents will have to tutor their children differently, and, and we policymakers have to think differently. I don't know, I'm, I suspect that the other countries are also thinking along those lines because uh, year in and year out, we face the same challenges and we use up our budget responding to these natural as well as economic and health challenges. We have to assume that uh, these changes will not change. There will always be changes. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you very much. That's all the time we have uh, today. Your Excellency, uh, Professor Emeritus Leonard Magtolis Briones, always uh, you are a source of inspiration for me personally. I always learn so much from you. We have learned certainly from you that uh, inclusiveness is the key part of uh, the national educational policies yes. and agenda, leaving no one behind, making sure all groups uh, are equally considered including uh, children in special need, uh, people with disabilities. Also very heartening to know alternate learning systems get even more emphasis during these times. The NGOs working together with the businesses, very importantly, contributing to the national needs from DEPED, uh, uh, but at the same time, straightening the barrel. That's very interesting for us, which really means that uh, wherever we can scrap any resources we do, and we bring it back to the education. And uh, congratulations on this uh, futures approach. I'm sure this is more we can learn and we can have a dedicated uh, webinar with you. And I'm sure many countries around the world will be able to learn from you. I congratulate uh, uh, your excellency for your amazing leadership always and to the people of Philippines for setting a standard during this COVID time for blended learning also making sure the uh, Pacific location uh, related uh, issues are dealt and the coordination at various levels from learning all the way to assessing for the exams. So with that, we congratulate uh, all colleagues who have been working very tirelessly under your leadership and also your partnership with UNESCO. And we continue to learn together, making sure education as a basic human right is delivered yes, to everyone. Yes. Yes. There is no one yes. behind. While change is uh, forever, but at the same time, there should be continuity. Yes. Education should never stop. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I hand it back to Director Marge.